It's once again a joy to bring God's word to you this morning. And I wanted to start with looking at a couple of the bad decisions I made when I was younger. I'm sure many of you can think of many of the bad decisions you made. But one of them that I used to make was uh, I used to play soccer after church. That wasn't the error. But we would always go out for lunch after church. And as a young guy, I thought the best food to eat before a sports event in which you're gonna run really hard was McDonald's. And so I get myself a Big Mac, some chips, a milkshake, and occasionally I'd even eat a second Big Mac, and I thought this was fuel for my body. And then I'd play 40 minutes of five-a-side soccer. And you can imagine, after 20 minutes of soccer, I'd be running around with a Big Mac in my throat right over here. And just this sickening feeling came over me, and as you can imagine, occasionally that Big Mac didn't stay there. It went somewhere else. But what I want to get at more is that feeling is that I kept making this decision thinking that it would turn out differently. And every single time, I would go out to McDonald's and I'd go, oh, this is a bad decision. And I didn't really have peace with that decision, but I thought maybe I can get through it this time. And every single time, Big Mac in the throat. And what I want to key in on is that word peace. Have you ever had that? You're making a decision that you don't have peace with? How does it feel? It feels quite sickening, doesn't it? It feels like you got that Big Mac stuck in your throat. That terrible, anxiety-driven way of going about things, and your muscles start to tense up, and you just feel really bad. You don't feel at peace. This morning, I'd like to talk to us about peace, but not just peace over decisions. I'm talking about peace in our whole life. The idea of being at peace in whatever circumstance that you are going through. And I think it is something that we definitely need and desire because of what we're going through right now. Think for yourself, even as we just look big scale, Think about, are you having peace with living in South Africa right now? I'm sure some of us are living with anxiety. And for some of us who are able to think about this way, you may be even thinking, is South Africa the place for me and my family? Maybe some of you are thinking about the electricity situation. And you're going, I don't know what to do with this. And you're just, you feel your muscles tensing up, not just because you don't have electricity at home, but you think about work, you think about everything that's going on. And you're just not at peace. And every time you get in the car, it just feels like your body is twisting and turning. Maybe for many of you, it's not just the bigger things, it's the things that are in your life personally. Maybe it's even thinking about your job. It's interesting for me, for my father, he was in a job for 35 years. He was in one job. He had security in that job. It was a good job. And as I think about today, and I don't know if it's our culture or our generation, but we're swapping jobs all the time, and you never feel like you're in a place that's secure and safe. You feel like the next thing could happen and your job's gone. And then these finances... And once again, your body writhes in pain. You can feel ulcers developing in you. Maybe it's not your job. Maybe it's relationships. And your relationships with your family, with your husband or your wife or with your kids. What used to be easy and going well feels broken and struggling. And you just feel like, what's around the corner? And you feel that metaphorical Big Mac in your throat. You feel sick all the time. I think what all of us desire is to have peace. And I'm not just talking about worldly peace, the peace that you get after war, but peace, a peace from God. And this morning, that is what is on offer. But the catch with this peace is it's gonna cost you something. We're gonna get to that, but I want you to think about this. If you could have peace right now as you sit, doesn't mean your circumstances have changed, doesn't mean that life isn't difficult, but that you could sit here and be calm and be good and be at peace, 
What would you give for that? I would give almost anything to have that peace. To have that peace with God. And so let us go into our text this morning as we look at peace for the journey ahead of us. Let us come into our text as we continue in the Psalms of Ascent as we prepare ourselves for this year, just as the Israelites would have prepared themselves as they walk up to Jerusalem, as Mike shared with us in the first week, let us now go read Psalm 131. Psalm 131, which says this. A song of ascent of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. The key verse that I want you to keep your mind on is that but I've calmed and quieted my soul. As I speak about peace, that is the feeling, that is the place that we want to be at, as we desire peace in uncertain times. But to get there, as I said, it's gonna cost you something. And so the first thing that we're gonna look at is peace instead of pride. What it's gonna cost you is your Pride. Now, hopefully, you recognize that, yeah, that's something I should want to give away. But I want us to have a proper understanding of pride this morning. Because for myself, and I think scripturally as well, but I think the great danger of our time is not the difficulties we're having with the sexual revolution or the idea of deception in this world. Those are obviously bad, but the main problem is pride. Because I think from pride leads into all those other areas. The reason I'm willing to give up on truth is because my truth matters. I'm the one who defines truth. Because at the heart of it, I feel I am better than everyone else. Even though I won't say it out loud, subconsciously I'm thinking the world should revolve around me. Pride is our great problem. And another word that often is associated with pride is narcissism. Oh, I always get that word wrong. Narcissism. Now, I want us to have a quick look at a list that looks at what a narcissist does. And I want you to go through this list with me and just think about narcissists, think about what they do. So let's look at the list. Let's look at a few of them first. Has a grandiose sense of self-importance. Two, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Believes that they are special and unique and can only be understood or should associate with other special or high status people. Requires excessive admiration. Next part of the list. Has a sense of self, sense of entitlement is interpersonally exploitive, lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of them, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. Now when I read that list, or go with me on this journey, this is how I read the list first. When I first thought of the word narcissism, I had someone in mind immediately. A celebrity, someone. I was like, yeah. And as I went through this, I was like, yeah, they're they're a narcissist. But as I got further down the list, I thought, actually, I think I know quite a few narcissists. Uh, Quite a few of them, the people around me. And maybe that's because of social media and other things, but I think our world struggles with this quite a lot. And then as I got to the bottom of the list, I started to realize, hey, I think I have many of these traits. I am one that struggles with this as well. I am prideful. I love the way in which John Piper 
describes pride, he explains it in two ways. He speaks of pride as the ones, the pride of having. These are the people who we deem are superior. There are people who go out and boast of what they have, the pride of the having. Now some of us here might live in that realm, but I think many of us live in this realm of pride. It's the pride of wanting. The pride of, I want that admiration. I want that superiority. And this is just as equal. It is pride as well. And we suffer and we struggle in this. And the problem with pride, it is the exact opposite of peace when we think of God. Because in pride, it becomes about me. I can do it. I'm strong enough. I don't need anyone else. And your muscles tense up and you think that you can power through it. And then it gets worse. It then becomes, I deserve this. It's mine. Pride. And that pride, if you really look at it, never finds peace. And just as examples of this, think about the billionaires in this world or the people we deem as having a most of the things in their life sorted out. Do they seem at peace? When I see soccer players who have all these multitudes of money and the amount of money they make each week and seem to have a great life, getting to do what they want, do they seem at peace? They just don't. And as you look at the many famous people who seemed like they had everything that they wanted when they got to their deathbeds, they said, I followed the wrong thing. They didn't have peace. Peace is not found there. Yes, we should have goals. Yes, we should go after things. But in going after them all on our own, we will not find peace. We will just find more of what we don't have and we will desire it more. And I think if we look into this text, we find out how David deems we find peace. And the way he looks at it is to run away from pride. Look at with, with me in the first verse here. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. The picture here is feeling. I do not feel as though I am better than others. I do not feel as that I deserve more than others. In fact, from David's perspective, it's gonna be, I deserve nothing. Because as I came into this world, I brought nothing and therefore deserve nothing. I am not better. He then takes it to the next part. He says, my eyes are not raised too high. The picture here is his countenance, his appearance. And I'm not just talking about the way he looks. It's not about being dressed well like I am this morning. But it's more the picture of this idea of like, I appear better than you. As I look upon these people, I am better. And then he goes even a step further And he says, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. So then it moves into the realm of action. For him, it's I run away from pride. I do not press more into it. These things are too great for me. I leave them alone. I run away. You see, David had this correct understanding of pride. And what's interesting when you look at the scriptures and you look at how God speaks of his power, of how great he is, he always uses three examples. The first example he uses is creation. I brought things into being. It's how powerful he is. It seems obvious. Speak things into being with word? Yeah, 100%. The second example that he uses is resurrection. I made someone who was dead alive. I beat death. The third may surprise you. The third, for God, in exhibiting his power, 
is he humbles the proud. And you see this throughout scripture. One of my favorite stories is the one of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. This man who was the greatest king of his time, he ruled over the known world and deemed himself more worthy than others. And what God does to him is make him like a beast until he humbles himself. David understood this. And unfortunately, I often lack that understanding. Too often I am proud. And now I'm saying this as a man who has spent years studying the word, who now stands in front of you as a pastor preaching that word, and I still struggle with pride. And the way in which I struggle with pride is often in the preaching of the word. What often happens for me is I preach, I then come out of the service, and hopefully many of you will say, that's a wonderful, amazing sermon. And that's not my problem. It's good to give encouragement to a preacher. I don't want you to stop that. But it's where I take it next. I then go home and go, yeah, I am a wonderful preacher. I am really good. In fact, I preach fire. And so then when I start looking for churches in Cape Town, these churches, you know, I don't think they qualify. I need to come to these churches. They're deserving of my preaching capability. And I've lost the very essence of what I was supposed to be doing because of my pride. I've lost what it means to find actual peace because I've put myself at the front of the queue. What it should be, how it should work, as David is going here, for to not feel what I should do is to have empathy towards others. To see other people. To spend time with them. To care for them. That will make my heart not feel higher. For my eyes to be able to see others, but also to see myself truly. The very way to run away from pride is to be vulnerable. To actually recognize who you are. To take a hard look and go, man, this person is broken and needs God. And then lastly, to actually run away from it. And what I mean here for you, each one of you this morning is to literally run away. When you get home and if you feel pride, go out on the road and run. And you won't feel pride for very much longer <laughs> as that body breaks down. Run away from it. Run away from pride because as we do this, we will find peace. Because as I see what I need, I then see that the only one who will provide it is God. And it requires me to release myself and hand myself over to him and to go, God, you are the only one worthy. But maybe you're still not just catching it yet. You need to see that second step of where peace really is. And so this is the second point. The second point is this, the pleasure of God instead of the pleasure of life. Now, as I say the pleasure of life, I'm sure many of you can think of many things. Quickly, the bad things. But I'm not even just talking about the bad things. I'm talking about anything. Anything that comes over God is an idol. And anything that comes out of God is going to put your life out of whack. What do I mean by that? Well, as I think about my daughter and my son, when they were first building buildings, and even as myself when I was younger, you'd start with the wrong parts of the building, and they'd build these buildings up, whether at Lego or blocks, and ultimately what would happen? Wobble, fall. I remember when I was younger, I'd build a building, wobble, fall, throw a tantrum. We often do the same thing with God when we build upon the pleasures of life and make that what we go after first, the building becomes out of whack 
and eventually falls. And what is left in the rubble? Ourselves. In turmoil, in brokenness, in hurt. But we need to go after the pleasures of God, but I know I'm there with you. The pleasures of God aren't always easy. In fact, as I think about the pleasures of God, often it is hard. It is really hard. Walking with the Lord requires sometimes too much of me. I even think about some of the simple things like reading God's word. It's hard. Because this is not just any mere book. This is not just me reading pages. But this is spending time in God and being convicted about it. I've spent eight years of studying this and I still struggle to read my word. Because I know when I pick it up, it's going to hurt. It's not like reading a fiction novel. I have to put it aside sometimes. It's hard. So I'd rather not do it. But also the problem is that going off to God, also it's too slow. I don't get the things I need now. It takes time. Pleasures of life are right here. I feel like I can grab them, but the pleasures of God seem too far off, too slow to reach. But my worst and what is most convicting to me is that sometimes it's just not enough. What do I mean by that? Go back into the text and look at the end of verse two. It says, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. For those of you who have had babies, especially mothers, you'll catch this concept. The concept is that in the beginning, the child, all it desires is milk. Desires milk from the mother. It'll cry for milk and that. But once the child is weaned off the milk, then where is the child's desire? The mother. Just wants to be with the mother. It's no longer about the milk. In the same way, unfortunately for myself, I am still like that little child that just wants milk. And so as I think about my relationship with God, how it often works out, is God is not enough, it's what he gives me is what I want. That's my desire. I want what he gives me instead of just him. And I'm not talking about just those people who think about Ferraris. For some, t- for some reason, Ferraris is always the worst thing in a sermon. I don't know why. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about anything in this life. When I think about my relationship with God, it's often revolved around, Lord, give me this. Help me with this. And when he does, thank you, God. And just to really push that example home, think about your prayers. When you pray, how do you pray? It's often a list of what God needs to give you. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking God. You should ask God. He tells us to. But now compare your prayer to the prayer Jesus told us how we should pray. How does that prayer go? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, then we get to the request. Give us, give us this day our daily bread. And it's one line, and then we come to forgiveness. Quite often for me, it's a lot of ask, not a lot of who God is. I mean, when do you really pray about just who God is? God, you are good. God, you're all powerful. God, you, you provide like no one else on earth. God, you are merciful. God, you're eternal. God, you are unchangeable. Amen. When was the last time our prayers were like that? When was God enough for you and not just what he gives? It saddens me even as I think about how we often present the gospel to people who do not know. It's not about the person, but about the destination. You should become a Christian so you don't go to hell. Not, you should become a Christian because you get to have a relationship with the one. The one who died on the cross. The one who conquered death. The one. And you see, if God becomes enough for you, 
that is where peace is found. Because it is no longer all the things that I need, but it becomes, God, you are enough. My life can be in chaos. All the circumstances around me could be in trouble, but then I go, I'm with God. As I think about my kids, just the picture of them, even though they have hurt themselves, even though everything is going wrong, they come, they hold me, they cuddle me, and everything is okay. That needs to be our relationship with God, that he is enough. And then the pleasures of God will outweigh the pleasures of life, and then you will find peace. And when you find that peace, please Take pleasure in that peace. Take pleasure in it. How do I mean? Start living in the now. So often in our life, we're thinking about what's coming around the corner. And I'm not saying don't prepare for the future. Definitely prepare about the future. The scriptures tell us to. Don't go to live in the now, spend all my money and see what happens. Live in the now, though, by the sense of going, I'm going to think about what I have. I'm going to think about who God is and just enjoy it. Be at peace with it. Yes, I have anxiety over the things that are going to come, but God is enough that he will help me deal with it. Let God be enough for you. And if that's still too difficult for you, I don't even know how I'm going to get to that. That sounds too far away then do what I often ask couples to do when I counsel them. Often when people come to you with trouble in their marriage or relationship, they're looking for that silver bullet. They're looking for that one thing that they've never thought about. They're looking for that thing that will just fix everything straight away. And often in counseling, that doesn't exist. Often in counseling, when you counsel a relationship, what you tell them to do is go back to basics. Go back to what you should be doing. Go back to the beginning. Connect with one another. Know one another. Spend time with one another. And in that, the relationship will mend. There's no little thing right here to fix everything. And in the same way with God, go back to basics. If you're struggling to really find peace, go back to knowing him and loving him. And in that, you'll start to find peace. And so part of that is reading the Bible. And I know, as I say that as a pastor, you expect that, everyone nods their head, and they'll go out and maybe read their Bible. Really go after it. Find out who God is. Know Him. Spend time in the spiritual disciplines. Pray. Our GC groups this year will be going through spiritual disciplines. Get involved with them. Have people around you that you can be vulnerable to so that you may find peace in God. And if you really go after it, there is a great gift that awaits you. Now, this is not going to be on the board, and this is not, I don't want you to turn to it in your scriptures, but Philippians chapter 4 has this beautiful verse. So I'd like to ask you all to close your eyes and just picture this for a moment. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then catch this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And keep your eyes closed. I just want you to think about this for a moment. The scriptures right here, the scriptures that speak truth, the scriptures that tell us how to live our lives, speak of this peace as something that we can't even fully understand. How great must that peace be? And for a moment now, I want you to imagine your life this year What would your life be like if you had that peace? If you would be able to sit at home or at work and be at peace, be calm, and your soul quieted, no matter what is going on around you, what would that feel like? 
Is that not something to go after? And the way you go after it, give up your pride and recognize that God is enough and live in that and you will find peace. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you. Thank you for who you are, that you are a good and gracious God, a God who is just, a God who is righteous, and a God who loves us. We are undeserving of all of this, Father, and yet you do it for us because of who you are. Forgive me, Father, for how often my pride gets in the way. How often my pride gets in the way of the things that you have an offer of joy and hope and peace. And I pray, Father, for everyone here this morning, just as David prayed for Israel, that our hope will not just be in the future, will not be in other things, but our hope will be in you, Lord. Forever may our hope be in you so that we may find peace, a peace which your son gave us, Father. Thank you that your son died on the cross for us. I pray that each of us will desire to know him more. And in that desire to know him more, that we would go after you and spend time with you. In his great name, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.